بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا حبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقال ربكم ادعوني استجب لكم ان الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخرين الله عز وجل tells us all in surah number 40 surah al ghafir number verse number 60 but your sustainer says call unto me and i shall respond to you Verily, they who are too proud to worship me will enter hell, abased. My brothers and sisters, an early scholar from 3rd century, Ibn Rajab, rahimahumullah, was asked, or he, was, he mentions in his book, that Ibrahim ibn Adam, a 3rd century scholar, was asked about the saying, and your Lord says, call on me and I will respond. What does it really mean? Ibrahim ibn Adam is well known for being very philosophical and very succinct with his beautiful advice and response. So when somebody asked him, what does this verse actually mean? Call on me, I will respond. And this questioner also said, we supplicate. And we're not answered. We make dua. Allah says, call upon me and I'll respond. But we supplicate. It looks like our duas are not being answered. So Ibrahim ibn Adam said, perhaps the reason why your duas or our duas are not being answered in the way we would like it to be answered are as follows. Number one, you know Allah and yet you do not obey Him. Number two, You recite the Qur'an, yet you do not act according to it. Number three, you know shaitan, yet you have agreed with him to follow him. Number four, you proclaim that you love Prophet Muhammad yet you abandon his sunnah. Number five, you proclaim your love for paradise, yet you you do not act to gain it. Number six, you proclaim you fear the fire of hell, yet you do not prevent yourself from sins. Number seven, you say indeed death is true, yet you have not prepared for it. Number eight, you point out the faults with others, yet you do not look at your own faults. Number nine, you eat of what Allah has provided for you, yet you do not thank him. And number ten, You bury your dead, yet you do not take lessons from it. Ten golden advice given by Ibrahim ibn Adam for us to understand why perhaps our dua isn't being answered in the way we would like the dua to be answered or simply dua is not being answered. There is a hadith of Rasulullah How can Allah answer the dua of a believer when his earning is haram? when his clothing is haram, when his sustenance is haram, while his entire living is composed of haram activities, how can Allah respond to such people? So my brothers and sisters, in the context of the month of Ramadan, the month of forgiveness, month of dua, month of extra prayers, month of taqwa, month of saving our necks from the fire of hell, I'd like to bring to your attention perhaps why we should consider our own actions and our activities and then ask why is our dua not being answered so let's talk one at a time you know Allah yet you do not obey him you're a believer you are here in this mosque you would not have come to the mosque going through all the hardship of driving parking in the cold in the rain you come doesn't matter what weather we face we have seen the number of people grow multiply Subhanallah, from where we began with 500 people, now we have over 1,500 people praying Jum'ah with us. 
within a matter of 18 months. It shows the demand of our Muslim communities growing every day. Every mosque that opens, the demand outstrips whatever that there is. I remember Eastern Mosque, when it was catering for 3,000 people, it expanded to 5,000. And then it applied to the local council for further expansion because the congregation was, has grown. So they then extended to 10,000 capacity. On the day of the new mosque's extension opening, 25,000 people turned up. And the police officer said, I thought you'd just done an extension to accommodate the people, and yet we have to block all the side streets. And now they've done another extension, and it is still full. It is an infinite need for our community, I believe. Allah, he is a good sign, and we should celebrate it. But this should be coupled with a serious introspection of the quality of us and our belief and our practices. Not just robotic belief, not just robotic practices, but conviction based on yaqeen, conviction based on certainty. I know Allah exists. I know, you know Allah, He exists. You know Allah knows and sees everything that you do. You know Allah is aware of everything and everything that you think or you don't even think. Allah is omnipresent. Allah is omniscient. Allah is omnipotent. We believe in all of those. Yet, do we obey him in his totality, in the totality that we are supposed to obey? As Allah says in the Quran, أُدْخُلُوا فِي السِّلْمِ كَافَّةِ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطْوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوهُ مُبِينٌ Enter Islam completely and fully. And do not follow the footsteps of shaitan, for shaitan is your open enemy. My brothers and sisters, ask yourself this question. Do we truly obey Allah? Do we truly take Allah's advice and Allah's orders seriously? Or do we cherry pick between the ones that suit us and the one that doesn't suit us? We pray five times a day and yet we'll get into fist fight outside over food and arguments. We pray five times a day, we backbite and slander, swear and gossip. We pray five times a day, fast in the month of Ramadan. We cheat with our neighbors, with our government, with other people. If we are going to be consistent with obedience to Allah, it must not only be limited to rituals of five daily prayers and fasting and Umrah and Hajj, but it must also manifest itself in your daily to day living. If I can't be good to you, I'm not being good to Allah. If I'm not decent with you, I'm not being decent with Allah. If I'm not being honest with you, I'm not being honest with Allah. If I'm cheating you, I'm cheating Allah. Rasulullah said, Man ghashana falaysa minna. Whoever cheats isn't part of my ummah. And yet my brothers and sisters, there are people who pray five times a day. There are people who go to Hajj and Umrah every year. And look at the state of the ummah today. Look around the world and you see the plight of the ummah. You wonder with whether this ummah truly believes in Allah. You wonder whether this ummah truly has the power, that the power that empowered the companions to change the world. My brothers and sisters, number one, you know Allah and yet you do not obey Him. It's a lip service we often give. It doesn't come from our hearts. If we truly obeyed Allah, we will not allow what's happening in Gaza today. If we truly obeyed Allah, we would not have allowed what has been happening in India with the Muslims for so long. Kashmir occupied for 75 years. If we believe in Allah, truly, we will not allow what's happened to the Muslims in Yemen. If we truly believe in Allah, we will not have allowed what's happened in Syria today. If we truly believe in Allah, evil will not prevail in the world today. Goodness will prevail. We say we believe in Allah, but we haven't transformed ourselves, our, our thinking and our actions based on the true belief in Allah. People who believe in Allah, you know, they are the ones who Allah says in the Quran, they have no fear and they will have nothing to grieve over. They believe in Allah and they're steadfast and firm in Allah. No matter what happens, they are always resolute in their belief in Allah. Nothing will shake them, nothing will deter them. And yet this ummah is shaken very quickly. Many of us are available to be bought by interest groups and parties and governments. Many of, many of us are very willing to go and have iftar with the despots and dictators of the world. Many of us would be very happy to take photographs and selfies with genocide enablers. We would be very happy to take, shake hands with the leaders who are selling we weapons of mass destruction to all evil rulers of the world, including Netanyahu and his bunch. Where is your iman? Where is Allah in your life? If you have no shame in going and sitting with Kiyastama or the likes and taking pictures at, and calling it iftar with him. Astaghfirullah. How dare you do that? How dare you desecrate 
iftar in that way. It just demonstrates quality of our iman, quality of our belief in Allah. Number two, you recite the Quran and you do not act accord- accordingly. Many of us just read the Quran, have no clue what we're reading. Many of us read the Quran, kiss it, put it on the top shelf every now and again, read it and put it on the top shelf. We don't do anything. It's like you, you know, on your phone, we all have GPS. Imagine your GPS app, you keep on kissing it. Does it sound ridiculous? It does. The Quran is your life's GPS and you keep on kissing it. You don't put it in practice. Quran doesn't navigate you from A to Z, from the moment you are born until you die. My brother, I'm going to do Quran when it suits me. I'm going to leave Quran when it doesn't suit me. Are you going to take parts of the Quran and reject the other parts? What does Allah say about that? Those who do that, for them Allah has prepared misery on this earth and misery in the hereafter. Look at the Ummah today. We have selectively cherry-picked the Quran when it suits us. What's the plight of this Ummah today? Because we have cherry-picked the Quran. People of the Quran can't be defeated. People of the Quran can't be trampled over. People of the Quran can't be taken advantage of. People of the Quran never cower to any pressure, any power, any forces of the world. People of the Quran are good people. People of the Quran are not scums on the face of this earth. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, where are the people of the Quran today? If we truly believed in the Quran, if we truly recited the Quran, we should be putting it in practice. Number three, you know shaitan, and yet you've agreed with him. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطْوَةِ shaitan." Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Shaitan is an open enemy to you. We know shaitan exists. We know shaitan is active. We know shaitan exists from amongst human as well as jinn. We know shaitan is whispering and he's busy. But we somehow have agreed with shaitan. Sometimes our actions and our behavior is worse than shaitan. Even shaitan feels embarrassed when he looks at what we are doing to one another. Even shaitan feels embarrassed when he sees what we are doing with ourselves. He says, well, you know what? I was only arrogant once with Allah and I got kicked out of the heavens. Look at these people. They're arrogant 24 hours a day. Look at these people. They're disobedient to Allah 24 hours a day. Look at these people causing murder and mayhem in the world. Look at these people. Even shaitan probably feels sorry for some of the human shaitan who have exceeded even shaitan's disobedience in the way we see disobedience proliferate in the world today. If shaitan is true enemy to you, stay away from him. Don't follow his footsteps. Number four, you proclaim that you love the Prophet of Allah and yet you abandon the sunnah. Do you love the Prophet of Allah? Do we really love the Prophet of Allah or is our love of the Prophet limited to eating jilebis? I'm not saying Prophet ate jilebis. People say, oh, Prophet loved eating sweets. So let's eat sweets and that's the sunnah we love. I had an uncle who used to love eating pumpkin. He used to serve pumpkin every day. And I just got bored of pumpkin, saying, oh, my uncle, please, let's eat something else. He goes, that's a sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi I said, yes, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi also ate other things. Don't limit Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sunnah to things that are convenient to you only. Things that don't require much transformation. It's easy to wear the jubba. It's easy to grow your beard. It's easy to uh, look as if, look as if you're the person of sunnah. Look. Remember, as if you're the person of the sunnah. Actual sunnah is Prophet Sallallahu character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Rasul Sallallahu khuluk, his action, his behavior, his akhlaq, his manners and morals are the most supreme, sublime examples of, for humanity. That's what we should be following. How did he talk to people? How did he manage his affairs? How did he deal with his family? What did he do with his finances? How did he manage his anger? How did he talk to people? How did he negotiate? How did he compromise? How did he sign peace treaties around the world? What did the Prophet of Allah do in his mu'amalat, in his day-to-day activities, including how did he pray? Including how did he fast? Including how did he dispense his duty to Allah and his duty to human beings? We have reduced the sunnah to a set of dogmas, set of uh, ek, ek, outer manifestation, ostentatious display on the outside only, nothing inside. Well, my brothers and sisters, you don't love the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you think sunnah is in your jubba, if you think sunnah is in your turban, if you think sunnah is in your beard, you don't really love the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The one who truly loves, his, loves the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would follow the Prophet in his character as Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran. If you truly love the Prophet of Allah, let us transform our characters. Number five, you proclaim that you love paradise, yet you do not act to gain it. If you truly love something, you will do everything possible. 
You want to get a car. Some of you are fixated with a car. You would love a car, a particular brand. You work very hard until you've earned enough to be able to buy a car. You like a particular phone. You work very hard until you've saved up enough to buy a phone. You love a house that you want to buy or a build house or do something or go to a holiday destination. You would put in extra hours until you get it. That's what we are all like. We're very determined when we want something. If you truly want paradise, do you, de do you show determination in the same way in wanting paradise? Do you? Number six, you proclaim you are afraid of the fire of hell, yet you do not print, prevent yourself from the sins. You say there is a fire of hell. You are worried about the fire of hell. But in your actions, it looks like, yeah, maybe, maybe fire of hell exists. The true manifestation would be that you do everything possible not to get to the fire of hell. Fire of hell is awful to even imagine. You can't even put your finger in a, in a, underneath, in the, under, on top of a fire, it will, even if it's candle fire. It will burn your skin straight away. Pain of fire is intense for those who have been burnt. Those who know the pain of fire, they will remember what pain of fire is. And Allah is mentioning that again and again in the Quran, fire of hell has been prepared. Fire of hell has been prepared. Allah Azza wa Jal says, it is very uh, important for you and I to remember that the fire of hell has been prepared. And if we are the ones of Allah conscious, you will stay away from the fire. You will do everything. And Allah Azza wa Jal has taught you and I the dua for the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhib wa la'afu wa fa'afu anni. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhib wa la'afu wa fa'afu anni. Ya Allah, efface all my sins from my record. You, the, you love effacing. Please efface them. Don't leave anything on it. My brothers and sisters, we love paradise and we detest fire of hell. Let's act accordingly. Number seven, you say, indeed, death is true, yet you have not prepared for it. One of our friends, Allah is a non-Muslim. One of our good friends, actually, he's a non-Muslim. His father is suffering from dementia. He walked out of his house and walked into the North Circle Road yesterday and got hit by a van and instantly died. This is how life and death is. I heard it yesterday. For those of you who are stuck in the North Circle Road for three hours, that was the reason yesterday. Helicopters, ambulances, fire brigades, everything came. Wallahi, I didn't even know. I crossed that way. I went to the North Circle Road. I saw the traffic. I quickly turned around and went to a and went to East London. That's where I was going. I was avo avoiding the inevitable. Somebody has died. I can't avoid my death when it comes in my way. Even if I'm on the North Circle Road, if Malakul Moat has been sent to take my life, I, it doesn't matter where I am. I'll be dead. <coughs> when I heard this, uh, he, actually this man is a friend of our mosque. He was one, he's one of the owners of this, uh, original owners of this site. That's his father who's passed away. There are two friends, partners in business, who sold this site to us. One of the partner, uh, when, when I heard it, it was such a shock, such a kick. But don't we see death every day? Don't we hear about death every day? And yet we don't, we don't prepare for death ourselves. What does it mean to be prepared for death? M means I'm ready to face Allah when I'm dead. Are we truly ready to face Allah when we are dead? Ask yourself this question. Are you truly ready to face Allah if you were to die just now? Literally now. If Malakul Maut came to you, are you ready to face Allah? My brothers and sisters, month of Ramadan has been prepared for you to get ready in every way possible. And we don't. We don't take it seriously because it's a lip service for most of us. We see the dead. We bury them with our own hands. But we don't learn from the dead. We don't learn to be prepared for it. May Allah forgive us for our mistakes. May Allah enable us to understand the concept of dua and why dua is not being answered. And may Allah make us all come back to the right path and stay on the right path, determined to follow the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and uh, be the devout servant that is needed for our duas to be accepted. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم my dear brothers and sisters let me recap Allah Azza wa Jal says ادعوني أستجب لكم and ask and I shall respond ask and I shall respond it's a very simple statement from Allah and yet it has got so many layers of your behavior 
your conduct and your thinking that would determine how Allah would respond to you, whether Allah would respond to you or not respond to you, would be determined by you. If my son is being disobedient to me every day, if, son, if my son is conspiring to destroy my property and my wealth, if my son is backbiting and slandering me, if my son is being following the footsteps of his friends and not listening to the rules and regulations we as a family have set, if my son or my daughter did any of those, do you think I will keep a relationship with them for long? Do you think you will do the same with your children? No. Very soon you would say, okay, my son, you have your way. Go ahead. You have your life. Go on. If you want to do your own things, not under my roof. But we expect Allah to tolerate all the nonsense that we do, every evil that we perpetrate, and we think Allah is okay with that. It makes no sense. Why is it okay with Allah? Why should it be okay with Allah? Allah the creator, the master, the, the, the sustainer of this world, the one who has made you and I, why is it okay? Ibrahim ibn Adam then continues, eight, he says, number eight, you point out the faults of others, yet yet you do not look at your own faults. And we are very good at that. We're good at blaming everybody else. He is like this. He is like that. Why aren't you like this? Why are you like that? Constantly blaming everybody else. We don't look at ourselves. We don't look at ourselves. Why don't we look at ourselves? Because when we look at ourselves, we see how many faults we have. When you look at the mirror, the mirror tells you the truth. Look at yourself, my brothers and sisters. Do an introspection. How many sins am I committing on a daily basis? How often do I lie? How often do I cheat? How clean is my record? If my record was exposed into the world, how would I feel? Would I be embarrassed? If I was found out to be the one I am truly, what would be my status? Introspection is essential part of growing. And by the way, introspection is essential part of taqwa. If you can't evaluate yourself, you can't stand in front of Allah and ask for forgiveness. Part of it, asking for forgiveness is to evaluate yourself. Ya Allah, I've done this sin, please forgive me. I've done this wrong, please forgive me. I've done this injustice, please forgive me. And it's not enough for you to ask only Allah to forgive you. If you have done injustice to other people, you need to go and tell them, please forgive me, I've done injustice to you. And if they don't forgive you, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And they have the upper hand, they can demand anything they want. And you may have to do it. Because you've been the unjust one. If you've been backbiting, just look at it this way. If you've been backbiting about somebody, the person you've been backbiting about, you need to go and apologize to that person for backbiting. How many people have you been backbiting in your life? Who are you going to go and reach? How many people are you going to go and say sorry to? How many people have you, been, have you been gossiping about? How many people have we been cheating with or cheating against or all sorts of other things that we've done? Asking Allah to forgive requires you to Ask others to forgive and look at your own self and do evaluation of your own faults before you blame others. Number nine, you eat of what Allah has given you and yet you don't show any gratitude. Show me a food that doesn't belong to Allah. Show me a food that doesn't come from Allah. Show me a food that doesn't have its sources in the nature that Allah has created. Even the GM food, they still have to borrow an element from the nature to be able to replicate it genetically. And even if they create it artificially, it's nothing similar to what Allah has made naturally, abundantly available. Every bird that leaves in the morning comes back with stomach full. Every fish that swims through the oceans and the seas and the rivers eats its fair share of meal. Nobody stays hungry. They are grateful to Allah all the time. You and I are not grateful to Allah and therefore many are hungry and many are overeating and many are obese and many are starving. Many are famished and many are too fat. Because we are ungrateful, because we are imbalanced. We are a people who are gluttonous on one hand and selfish on the other hand. We don't care about other people. And Allah's, uh, Allah's advice is, be grateful for the food that you have. And part of gratitude is, don't eat too much. And month of Ramadan teaches you and I that. Don't eat too much. Let me ask you a question. Have you lost weight in the month of Ramadan? Don't answer me. But if you haven't lost weight in the month of Ramadan, something has gone wrong. You have not truly understood the concept of Ramadan. Ramadan is about reducing the amount of food you eat. Ramadan is about constraining yourself from eating too much. Ramadan is about learning re self-restraint so that you don't eat wrong food, wrong time, excessively. Ramadan is all about learning all this and being grateful to Allah for what He has given. And finally, number 10, you bury your dead and you do not take any lessons from the dead. You buried them. What's the lesson you take from the dead? You'll be there one day. When you bury your dead, what, do you, what lesson should you be taking? The dead has no clothes. Just two pieces of, or three pieces of shroud. That's it. That's all you will have. Doesn't matter whether you're wearing Rolex watch 
whether you're wearing Armani suit or whether you're wearing Gucci bag, it doesn't matter what you have on this earth. These are part and parcel of this earth, frivolous material. They will not go with you in your grave. Why chase these material? Why obsess yourself with these? Why? What is the game? What is the game? It's called feeding your ego. It's called feeding your ego. And the more you feed your ego, the more distant you become from the realities of death. You bury your dead and you don't take lesson from your dead. And that is the dead can't speak, can't move, can't do anything. The dead is dead. There's nothing they can do. You bury your dead and you don't learn lesson from the dead. And that is this dead has, this person who has died has nothing else to do. You, the whole world can come together. They can't benefit the dead. They're dead, finished. The record's closed. Dunya is closed. We don't learn from it. We, we bury the dead. We don't learn from the dead that this life is temporary. We are only here for a fixed period of time. We don't know how long we have. And yet we are going at 100 miles an hour. We will die any second. Any minute we'll be dead. And we don't learn from it. We live on this earth as if we'll never die. We live on this earth as if this is permanent. The temporary nature of life, my brothers and sisters, must be learned from the dead. So to finish off today's reminder for me and for all of us, month of Ramadan was the perfect opportunity to shape yourself to train yourself, to become better, and to become more dignified and more honorable, like you should be, like we should be, as Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, we are human beings made with honor and dignity because we're intelligent, we have a brain, we have capacity to decide between right and wrong. Using all of those innate capacity, rise human beings, become the human being you're supposed to be. Stand for the truth, stand for justice and fairness, and be with Allah, and remember Allah's presence in your life. For taqwa is the essence of a believer. And taqwa makes you a person who does not allow evil to proliferate. And yet this ummah allows evil to proliferate. This ummah has not gained taqwa. Every year they get the opportunity to take taqwa, but that they don't have taqwa within them. My brothers and sisters, to finish off, month of Ramadan is about to leave us. We don't know whether we will be alive for another Ramadan. I feel sorry that Ramadan has gone. And I don't know whether I've made the maximum and the best of the month of Ramadan. I don't know whether you have or not. But please do evaluation before it goes. You've got three or four more days to go. 27 night is tonight. And then maybe three nights or two nights and the Ramadan is over. Whatever you're doing, please make the last attempt to ask Allah to forgive you. Make the last attempt to consciously come back to the right path. Make the last attempt to make a promise that I will remain steadfast and resolute on my path. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, Ya Akramul Akramin, forgive us, Ya Allah, forgive us, Ya Allah, forgive us, Ya Allah. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibu al-afu wa fa'afu anni. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibu al-afu wa fa'afu anna. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibu al-afu wa fa'afu anna. Ya Arhamur Rahimin, you are the eraser. You love erasing, erase all our sins, Ya Allah. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana. وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ يا رحم الراحمين, We have wronged against ourselves. Ya Allah, forgive our mistakes, Ya Allah. If you have no mercy on us and if you don't forgive us, we'll be lost, Ya Rabb. يا رحم الراحمين يا رحم الراحمين اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم أجرنا من النار اللهم أجرنا من النار وادخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رحم الراحمين save us from the fire of hell يا الله save us from the fire of hell يا الله save us from the fire of hell يا الله and grant us paradise يا الله grant us paradise يا الله grant us paradise يا رحم الراحمين يا كرم ولا كرمين in this blessed month of Ramadan enable us so that we can gain taqwa for the remaining days with the remaining days يا الله يا رحم الراحمين protect our families يا الله Unite our hearts, Ya Allah. Bring us together, Ya Allah. Bring our hearts together, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin. Free Al Aqsa from occupation, Ya Allah. Free Gaza from the war, Ya Rahman Rahimin. Free Gaza from the oppression, Ya Allah. Free Gaza from the injustices, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin. Remove all the oppressors of the world, Ya Allah. Destroy the oppressors, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin. Remove the tyrants and the despots from all the Muslim countries, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin. Remove the Muslim rulers who are despotic and illegitimate, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin. And replace them with better people, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, make this Ummah the best of Ummah, Ya Allah. Return all of us to your deen, Ya Allah. Make us and make us understand your deen, Ya Allah. Enable us to love you, Ya Rahman Rahimin. Enable us to love your Prophet, Ya Allah. And enable us to follow your deen, Ya Rahman Rahimin. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samil alim. Ya Rahman Rahimin, give shifa from your shifa for those who are not well, Ya Allah. Give shifa from your shifa to those who are not well, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, have mercy on those who have passed away, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimin, we make special dua for our parents. 
Those of us who have lost our parents have mercy on their souls. Ya Allah, Rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani saghira. Rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani saghira. Rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani saghira. Ya Rahman Rahimin, protect our families and make our children the apple of our eyes. Ya Allah, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samil alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana inna kanta tawabu rahim. Inna Allah ya amuru biladu wal ihsan. Wa ita idil qurba. Wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. Ya adukum la'allakum tadakarun. Fadukuruni adukurukum. Wa ashkuruli wa la takfurun. والله يعلم ما تسنون أقيم الصلاة